Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome to the fireside chat with Xavier Lee. So Xavier Lee, Xavier is a has had a full career in what he calls corporate America, and what I call the corporate world. And um, after which he became uh, he 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 morphed into an executive coach, and he's now a trainer. Uh, he also has an L NLP background. Uh, so I'm going to ask Xavier, could you share with us uh, your journey from corporate America to being an executive coach? Appreciate the introduction, and I'm very honored to be here. I'm happy to be speaking with the group. Um, yeah, so my, my journey from the corporate world or even before what I was doing here, before I, uh, doing what I'm doing now, which is a lot of training and coaching, um, has been kind of unplanned and very serendipitous. Um, I like to call myself sometimes a corporate refugee because I, I, uh, um, I did have a pretty fun, successful career. I, I used to work at Fortune 50 companies, Fortune 100 companies like American Express, first in New York. Uh, and then I was actually sent to different areas, but I was in my last sort of position with American Express. I was sent to um, um, Asia Pacific headquarters in Hong Kong. So I worked for 17 different countries um, in kind of strategic planning roles. And then I was recruited by Cigna to work for their strategic marketing and planning also roles. And I had a great time in my last role with uh, Cigna Korea, which was one of the fastest growing international operation um, for, for the company. I had actually gotten three uh, almost four promotions in, in two and a half years. And my last position was actually uh, to become the chief marketing officer for Cigna Korea. But, you know, when I was being offered that position, I was a little bit hesitant. Um, and, you know, it kind of made me think about what I really, really wanted to do. Because part of the reason I was being offered this role was were because several people had gotten very sick including two of my peers who I was kind of replacing you know, uh, in a sense. And, and uh, one of them had actually died from stress. Um, and, uh, and one of them, the other also person passed away later on uh, due to stress-related reasons. So it really kind of gave me a wake-up call. And at that time, I was fairly recently married. And my wife, ex-wife, had, had told me at that time, like, no, don't get the job. So I want you to live. Um, so it kind of really made me think about what is it that I wanted to do, despite the fact that I was pretty good at my job. Um, so what, to make a little bit of a longer story short, I ended up coming back to the United States uh, with my wife. And then we had a kind of a challenging time. Um, you know, I was expat for, for many years in Asia and my wife was not from the US. So she went through a lot of, uh, cultural, cultural adaptations, and she had some bit of a culture shock. She faced like racism for the first time. And so things actually spiraled down really quickly before either of us knew what was happening. Um, so I found myself after about a year and a half being back in the US, divorced uh, without a job, I, I had quit the job that I had come back from in the US. I, I had another VP job here, but I was very unhappy with it. So I was very depressed and trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And so I started going to different webinars and, and not, sorry, uh, <laughs> now I kind of default say, defaultly say webinar because of COVID, but different workshops and, and seminars just to get sort of my motivation back. and, and get myself out of bed because like I said, I was going through some really tough time. Um, didn't really know who I was because I lost that sense of identity as a corporate guy, as a, you know, as a provider, as a husband. So I was going through a lot, a lot of transitions. But one of the things that I noticed when I was going through these seminars were how like these trainers were able to manage the audience, especially manage their audience. So coming from the marketing background, I, I just became very curious uh, about what, 
what was it that they were exactly doing? And I realized what they were doing was they were using some NLP neuro-linguistic programming or behavioral science kind of tools to help with the techniques. So I, uh, so I decided to kind of learn that just because I thought it was really uh, interesting. And I got very lucky to study with Robert Diltz and Judith DeLosier, who were one of the, the original cohorts um, who worked with John uh, Grinder and Richard Bandler in coming up you know, with uh, the, the, a lot of the techniques or the original techniques of NLP. Not only that, but they actually brought, in my opinion, a lot more heart into that. So uh, Judith DeLosier, for example, she was a, um, an anthropologist and a dancer. So she brought a lot of the somatic and the ecological component to, to um, NLP. So I learned NLP with um, just international group of people uh, who were specifically flying from, to, to study with Robert and Judy from all over the world. So they were some of the most, uh, you know, most committed and some of the brightest people in NLP. And I, I loved it. In fact, I think it kind of helped uh, metaphorically save my life because I was very, like I said, uh, depressed and, and I didn't even know that I had questions. And what NLP taught me at that time were some of the questions that I didn't even know I had. For example, what happened with my marriage and why was I actually good at my job as a leader, uh, even though I didn't quite know what I was doing, or at least I couldn't teach it to other people. And so neuro-linguistic programming, which at its core is really about uh, modeling human behavior, um, broke it down for me. And it taught me a lot of tools. And it was like being handed a manual uh, of being a human being. And it just kind of opened my eyes and I just really loved it. So I ended up studying it more for my own self-interest and I ended up becoming a uh, trainer and then master trainer. Uh, so I could, so I kind of certified, I got certified in the highest NLP that you can do. Um, and then people started kind of asking, wow, you know, I, I love, you know, when I was working you as a, with, as a partner, you know, I had some huge shifts. Would you mind coaching me? So people started asking me for coaching. Um, and then also I had some of my business school classmates or people I knew from the business world who would say, hey, you know, I heard you've been working with um, some interesting stuff. Would you come and teach uh, or train our team. Uh, and I know you have a great business background. I know you were great with your team. So can you, can you come and do that? So I started organically doing training and coaching without really designing uh, my kind of path towards that. So, you know, accelerate to nowadays, I've been working with Ideal Coaching Global which is a training school uh, that started in California and Mexico, and now here, you know, with, uh, in Asia, with Malaysia. So, so I'm very happy to uh, say that I've been really um, happy with the, and just be blessed with the journey that I've taken, even though it wasn't by design. I felt like I found my calling and. I saw KH's video the other day about Ikigai. And yes, it's, I feel like I felt my, you know, I found my Ikigai, um, being able to help people contribute, especially given my experience with what happened in the corporate world and, what, and why I left. I feel like I now have some real tools to help people find more fulfillment um, and, and become more, effective in their roles as leaders, as people who are living their life. What place does coaching have in the corporate arena? Okay. What, who are the people who are looking for coaching? And what kind of coaches are they looking for? And, and uh, are there any particular trends uh, mm. lately on, on, on the role of coach in the corporate world? So perhaps- yeah, thank you. Thank you, KH. Yeah, so that's a great, great question. Um, coaching traditionally in the corporate world was actually reserved for um, 
kind of star performers. Uh, in, in fact, it was it was kind of a perk and al almost like a finishing school or a grooming school for rising stars to prepare them for the next kind of um, their next role into the executive ranks. So I remember when I was at American Express, I mean, I would sort of see, you know, VPs or directs or senior directors being offered uh, executive coach. Uh, executive coaching because they were being groomed to go, sort of go to the next next level. So um, there was always kind of a big prestige about that. And like I said, the I, the fact about coaching is it's not it's not like therapy where it's like trying to help people fix something that's wrong. In fact, the emphasis in coaching in the corporate world has always been um, to make people who are good even greater like better right so um and it is very very similar to coaching in sports like making sure that you uh, are aware of your blind spots and having somebody who can give you uh objective uh you know sort of perspective to be able to give you feedback that's going to help you uh propel propel you in your career and in your in your uh, role in in the future roles right um, what I found is is that it's um, in recent years that's that idea of coaching has now been kind of going down further and I think part of the reason is because so many of the senior leaders and executives have had coaching so they know the value of that so what they're now uh, really basically advocating is to have coaching more available for middle management um, and not just the senior senior executives, but even for people in the middle management and even lower to increase their emotional intelligence, social intelligence, uh, and their leadership abilities in general. So um, the types of coaching that they're looking for, it, because they're Coaching is still a fairly new field. So what, what often companies want to look for is be able to assess very quickly is if, if the coaches are qualified or not. So one of the things that I, I've noticed is that now they look for people who are qualified or certified through, uh, through some very internationally recognized programs like ICF, International Coaching Federation. Uh, before, maybe 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't as important um, because it was still a small pool of people who got coaching and it wasn't quite as, as, uh, as widespread. But now as more coaches come aboard or people call themselves coaches, companies want to know that the quality of the coaches that they're hiring are, are people who are qualified and are indeed trained in a way that's very systematic and and who can really understand and deliver the goods, as we say, right? So I think uh, the, the kind of coaches who, who are sought after are people who have credentials from recognized, internationally recognized certification program like ICF, but who also have some business background. It's not completely necessary, but it's, that always helps to uh, you know, help with the talk um, and understand the language of the business or, or corporate coaching. But as I said, I think it's, you know, it's being spread out more and it, it's still now in the life coaching area, area too. Um, a lot of times people, that's also being recognized that people want somebody with certification and, and, and quality training. Perhaps uh, if you could distinguish between coaching and maybe other types of business consultancy or, or expertise, that's one. Right. Right. Uh, and, and then perhaps after that, uh, the particular type of coaching that you are involved in training people to do, yeah. uh, which involves uh, ontology, mindfulness, and ecology. You could speak of all three or just, just of the aspects that you are kind of more focused on yourself. So coaching is distinct from consulting. Um, 
or therapy, as I, as I kind of mentioned briefly about therapy, you know, therapy is more from people who are psychologists and usually they're trying to find out some issues uh, often dealing with maybe trauma or, or some uh, parts of their life that they're trying to come to terms with and, and trying to kind of fix it. So consult, uh, so therapy is slightly different from coaching because coaching, like I said, it's the emphasis has always been more of like, how do we help you get to the goal of, of what you want to achieve, right? How do you want, how do you, how can we help you uh, achieve the outcome that you want for your life or in the professional career aspect? So, and consulting is a little bit more of, now there's also different types of consulting, but when I was at American Express and saying that we hired a lot of with strategic consultants, strategy consultants, you know, big companies like McKinsey and, and Bain and so forth. But we also hired more tactical consultants. And the main difference is, is that often they will tell you that they're kind of problem solvers. So they will often bring some outside perspective and they will help solve some problems. And there are consultants uh, who will get in the, you know, get in the weeds with you and who will actually um, work on solving the problems, uh, you know, um, by creating, by providing different tools and, and so forth. And they'll actually do a lot of the work or there might be strategy consultant who will kind of give you the methodology and say, uh, figured out, analyze what the situation is and figure out the problems. And then basically it's up to the company to try to figure out, to execute and, and try to solve the problems that's been identified. Coaching is very different in the sense that, um, you know, we're, we're talking more about individuals and relationships and leadership, and they are helping people become better at whatever that they're doing, at whoever that they're doing. Um, although they can help solve specific problems, and often when I, in executive coaching roles, I've been involved in helping uh, resolve or, or identify specific issues. A lot of times what I'm doing is I'm helping them um, become better leaders. I mean, that's probably, probably the biggest difference. In fact, there's a book that I recently read um, which was called A Trillion Dollar Coach. Uh, it's about Bill Campbell, who was the coach to guys like, guys like Eric Schmidt, uh, the, C the CEO of Google. Um, he, he was also like you know, Steve Jobs coach. So he was a coach to all these CEOs and senior executives from some of the biggest names in um, some of the biggest names in Silicon Valley, right? In fact, he's called Trillion Dollar Coach because you know the, he's he's really credited at five people he was coached, guys like the CEO of, of uh, Google, saying that yeah, if it wasn't for his support and help uh, to bringing out the best in me, I don't think we could have achieved the kind of growth that we did. So he's being credited for creating trillion dollars worth of value, right? And if you read the book, it's actually fascinating because it's not there. Um, he doesn't really have a business background. Bill Campbell was actually, um, he, was, he actually was a baseball coach, a sports coach. Uh, but what he was, was well known for was really, really caring about his team members, coach, coach members. And as funny as this sounds, um, the, the, some of the most memorable passages in the book is when guys like, um, you know, the CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google's and, and CEOs of eBay, all these people talk about how, how Bill Campbell really loved him, you know, that, and they, or they allowed them to blossom. It's like, he talks about very, uh, what we call soft skills, like, you know, being able to be empathetic, um, listen in a way that you can really hear. So he talks, about, he talks a lot about love, which, is, which sounds really strange for a corporate America, but it helped all these amazing leaders 
kind of blossom and become best versions of themselves in order for them to lead their organizations. So, um, so I, I think the, the powerful thing about coaching is you're helping your client kind of tease, you're helping them tease out what's already in there, what's best in them, right? So I think that's probably some of the biggest differentiating factors. Now, we just had a, a first generation of, of um, Gen 11, uh, I'm sorry, first conference of Gen, Generation 11 for Ideal Coaching at US. And we happen to have a, um, an expert marketer and corporate marketer who joined our cohort. And, and after the first conference, first weekend of study, he said, oh my gosh, this is way, way more than I had imagined uh, the school. I'm getting a lot more than I expected. And he said, and even as a marketer, I'm not sure how to market this because some of it is so deep and it's so experiential. So he was, he was describing you know, how he would love to be able to um, really market this, but, but even as a, an experienced marketer, he was, he was a little um, uh, confounded by how do, how do I sort of convey this deep experiential um, you know, experience? And uh, some of the things that was described by the people who attended the ideal coaching is that uh, they said they were, um, they really learned how to listen. It sounds, uh, sounds really simple, but they said it was one of the most profound experiences because they realized for most of their life, they really didn't know how to listen or they haven't had the experience of, or very, very rare experiences of having been really been listened to and, be seen, and being seen. And they said that experience of being seen and being truly listened to, they said it was incredibly liberating and they, they realized how powerful that was. Which is, in fact, one of the things that um, that book and trillion dollar uh, coach about story about Bill Campbell. That's kind of what they're trying to convey, right? So this deep experience of being seen, um, and I think ideal coaching global. What we do is um, we we really make sure that the, we have a saying: we don't give up on a student. So we we really try to um, you know, we really try to commit, uh, to commit to having the student blossom as much as they can. And one of the ways we do that is ontology. So rather than focusing on specific like tools or methodologies, although we offer a lot of those, the main emphasis is on who are you being? Who do you wanna be? It's a way of being that we really emphasize. And in fact, this is the same thing that often that when I deal with executive co coaching clients, one of the requests that I often get is, well, you know, usually their sponsors, people who are paying, uh, who are sponsoring them to get coaching, they'll say, well, he's great. He's a great functional leader. Uh, however, we want, in order for him to become a general manager, to be an executive member, uh, we would love to have this person have show more gravitas or more of an executive presence. So, and the only way to do that is really by, um, by ontological kind of methodology of, of really working on the ways of being. Uh, the other, I think, um, uh, tool or foundation at Ideal Coaching is mindfulness. To, now ontology is just more philosophical unless you have a practice to support that. So the practice that we bring into it is mindfulness. Uh, and mindfulness in our case, it just simply means being able to be present um, to the, you know, being able to be aware of the present moment without judgment or with curiosity. So it's starting with self-awareness, but then an awareness that goes beyond yourself to others. Uh, this is a practice that we really ask, invite people to do, and we practice together both um, in conferences and outside of conferences so that people often uh, will take up mindfulness practice throughout their whole, throughout their whole 
course of study with Ideal Coaching Global. Um, the third part is ecology, you know, the, we, that we really is foundational in Ideal Coaching Global. And that's, so that's something that I learned um, <laughs> when I was learning NLP, because I learned all these amazing tools when I first was studying this. But, you know, the thing is, is that there are techniques and tools for you to be able to um, change your state, change my mood. Like I could get rid of suffering and pain. So, so I was doing that because I was in a lot of, you know, a lot of pain. And then I realized a few years later that wasn't ecological because I didn't learn the lessons that I needed to learn. I mean, there's a reason why we feel and go through different emotions. There's a, there's a, a valid reason for all of these. Um, and there's a valid reason why, you know, you don't ask people to just quit smoking without looking at the ecology of what possible benefits that smoking might've been providing that person. For example, like stress management or, or taking breaks or, or a chance to socialize with others. So, you know, in business, we call that systemic thinking. Um, so in, you know, by looking at things ecologically, we can one potentially um, more prevent some potential bad side effects, uh, some outcome or some effects that we possibly don't may not want. But we can also really, um, by thinking systematically and also by ecologically, we can also really pay attention and take care of the stakeholders, because usually we're not in isolation. We're usually part of a system. So when we are, um, you know, coaching, usually there are other people who are involved. So, you know, one of the ways that we deal with that is by looking at things ecologically uh, to see who are the stakeholders, who are the other people uh, that might be affected by the change. Um, and, you know, what are some of the potential possible good or bad outcomes that may also happen was an effect of you know what what changes might be happening, so, and uh, we use tools like uh, like I said mindfulness, but also uh, neuro neuro linguistic programming NLP, which is really a type of behavioral science. So I think uh, we provide a huge support and commitment to the students. And this also is um, I think demonstrated by the fact that we have very, very high levels of engagement from our alumni. So we often get almost one-to-one -one ratio of students to support staff because a lot of people want to volunteer to be staff coaches, staff mentors, or volunteer, uh, uh, you know, ass assistants. So there's a tremendous amount of support that we help you know, with Ideal Coaching Global for people to become successful as coaches. So. Given the nature of the training, uh, which is ontological, mindful, and ecological from ID, in, in ID Coaching Global, uh, what are some of the things that uh, a potential student might want to know is demanded of them? I use the word demanded uh, advisedly, demanded of them. And what does this training do to a person who undergoes that? So on, on a very personal basis. Um, that's a, a good question. Maybe a bit challenging to answer in some ways. So one of the things that I think I, I want to emphasize is that um, going through coach training, it's, especially with Ideal Coaching Global, is, is hard work. It takes commitment. It takes effort. You're not going to just sit there and go like, feed me, teach me, and then absorb all the information to make you successful. It's a practice. Um, so it's almost like, you know, like learning how to play an instrument or learning how to swim. You're not going to read a book on it and someone's not going to lecture you on it. And all of a sudden you're going to be a great musician or a great swimmer. You're going to have to get in the pool or you're going to have to pick up that violin or piano and keep practicing, right? It's the same thing with uh, coaching, at least the way we teach it. There are certain schools. In fact, I just saw an NLP certification program that was like, they were charging like $7 to, 
and they said you can be a certified NLP coach, uh, which just kind of made me smile because it's feasible. I mean, there are lawyers who become, uh, you know, who can, who pass bars and who can practice law without going to law school, but that's because they practice, because they study and they actually go out and do these things. Um, so coaching, NLP, mindfulness, these are all practices. So we're, we're there to support you and we're there to do it with you. You know, this is the power of community and power of Sangha, but it will take work. So that's the, you know, it's like going to graduate school. So for people who feel like, oh, you know, I'll go to coaching school because I wanna fix some issues I have, um, that's probably not going to be a good enough reason for for them to really stick with it and to commit to it um, because this is this is the uh, time where um, what we you know sometimes the metaphor that I give is is that you know if you've been drinking from the fountain, fantastic, but coaching school, you're now going to be the fountain. you know you're going to we're going to transition you from being um, being a consumer to becoming the teacher or sharer or the guide. So um, so this this takes work and this takes commitment. Um, so that's the thing that I'd like to maybe emphasize, Cage. But there's great, also great rewards. Yeah. People, like I said, people who come through the programming, they, uh, almost everyone says that their life has been transformed a very positive way. But they also talk about not only their life being transformed, but how they were able to really, um, that, that their families and their friends have noticed and you know, that it's made a huge impact in their communities. Mm -hmm.